we doing, fellas? Oh, Hello. there you are. We can hear you. John Connor, Dog Eat Dog. Welcome to Facebook. Yes, sir. So glad to have you on. Yeah. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's our pleasure, sir. It's our pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute legend in Europe. Dog Eat Dog. Ah. Come on. Come on, hey, worldwide a... legend. Come on, why stop with Europe? Yeah, why no, no, I'm just Europe, saying because I'm, I'm in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> we know this thing's worldwide. Indeed, of course. How you doing, mate? Fire, man. Just happy happy to uh to be loved anywhere in the world, and that's a fact. Yeah. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Well, you've got fans everywhere, so you know. It's uh it's good, mate. It's good. It's good. Me and, me and this Thanks, guys. I was wondering who's Sam because that's who sent me the email. Yeah, I'd yeah, be a bit, I'd be a bit confused if my real name was Hobo. I'd be worried if my parents called. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I've been called worse. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> believe it. So now you're on facing the crowd. We'll hit you with our regular first question, um, which is, what was the first band you ever saw live? Kind of your first live experience if you can recall it yeah for sure um i am not going to count local acts because that uh even though i should because that was probably more transformative than anything is seeing uh let's say young men teenagers maybe uh four five six years older than me playing at the local uh Labor Day or Memorial Day, whatever it was, it was in my town and I saw bands playing Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. And even though it wasn't music or material that I was familiar with at, at that time, it made a big impact on me to see kids playing rock music. And every time along my development, let's say, I saw my peers doing it, that gave me an inspiration uh, whether I knew it or not, conscious or subconscious, that was there. But my first official uh, show with a with a real ticket, I would say, was uh, Stay Hungry tour, Twisted Sister, uh, Lita Ford opening, and Rat in the Middle. So nice, yeah, yeah. And it was at the pier in New York City along the Hudson River. They would build out this uh, this live venue. Uh, on one of the old piers and they they'd held shows there in the 80s and that was the first time my parents said yes I could go and I went with some friends and it was memorable well they actually built a pier for the gig I mean that's that's outrageous sounds very it was either they built the pier as an existing pier and they just you know made stuff on it it this we're talking 1985 so this is a long time ago. I can't remember exactly what the 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 technical build out was, but the moment yeah. was huge. Uh, and I just remember Twisted Sister. It made sense because now I know what uh, what a great live act they are and how much they cut their teeth in small clubs. But D. Snyder ha- held the crowd wrapped around his pinky, and it was uh, it was incredible. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that was at the peak of their powers then, I guess, all three of those bands. Yeah, I mean, yeah, was, yeah. Yeah, you were exactly. There, definitely there in the moment of, of those acts, weren't you? I mean, in the moment as it was happening. And yeah. uh, I'm lucky in my life I had quite a few of those. Yeah. Amazing. That is that is a good first gig. That That's is, yeah, <laughs> awesome. It's Twisted Fucking Sister, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? True story, I haven't seen him since. Wow, no. You just no nope. magical memory. Yep. It's probably good that you, I've seen you've got that memory of them at that time. It's probably good that you haven't seen them in like later years, I suppose. I... Oh yeah, they were fire. They had the big chain link fences, spray painted pink up. I mean, it was everything you'd want out of a rock show. Uh great atmosphere, uh sunny, sunny night, New York City, uh sun going down over the Hudson, and here was a band. Uh, I'm just talking to his sister in their prime at the peak of their powers. This was, I want to rock. We're not going to take it, killing it on MTV. And uh, they just had the production. They had the sound, the atmosphere, the whole shebang. Yeah. And how could you not get into music after that, right? (laughs) Well, that's true. I mean, I was already hooked, truth be told. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, they, they... 
they they like you say you cut cutting their teeth they spent years like, in the smaller clubs didn't they working their way up the hard way didn't they didn't have any social media yeah. do that stuff they just did it and built themselves up but yeah that was a well-earned victory and uh even now i'm i'm, I'm happy for those guys and we're not going to take it is my karaoke uh you know shut the night down after we're not going to take it <laughs> Somebody else try and do better. All right. That's all I'm saying. I, I'm not a, I'm not a bragger, but I will say, you know, try and follow that. Yeah. yeah. But so you, Perk said does a great uh, Alice Cooper, don't you? I do Alice Cooper poison. That's, that's his go-to. Poison. I was going to say, man, what, what do you got? No more Mr. Nice guy. You got, you got 18. That's my jam. Oh, nice. <laughs> It's gonna be a karaoke off in a minute. <laughs> Let it fly, boys. I got my ear I got my in ears going here. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> what about the uh the first time you performed live like as a band or with a band? Would that would that have been with Doggy Dog or would that have been with a different band? No, no, that was way prior to Doggy Dog. Uh about 15, 16, some mates of mine had a thing going on. Uh, they were jamming. They were two guitar players and a drummer. They had no singer, no bassist. And my buddy Dave Pinchewski said, hey, he was the drummer. They practiced in his basement. He said, you can do this. You know, you're singing along with me every day to these albums. Uh, you know, you got a decent voice. I think you can do this. You're a little bit of a wild man. I think <laughs> uh, I think you should be a singer. And didn't take much pushing, of course. I was a little shy, but we were just in the basement and, you know, a couple buddies would come by or if we were lucky, we could talk a few girls into coming over or something or even one girl was enough <laughs> just to perform. <laughs> uh, so I got into singing, like I got in the band and then, I don't know, like maybe half a year later or something, we had a show. We were very lucky where Dave and Sean and myself grew up in northern New Jersey there was a little club called the China Club, and they would allow underage patrons and underage bands on Sunday nights. So we knew about it. We were already going, and my band got up, and we, we got a chance to play there live for the first time. And, you know, we were – I was doing, like uh, – my first time on stage with them was at the high school Battle of the Bands, and we did, like, Ozzy, we did Rat, we did Van Halen just uh just covers and that's how i got my start but you know once once i got that taste of the light and the energy uh of performing in front of people there there's there's no turning back i mean there's pictures of it of that very gig on my facebook page you don't have to look far to to find wow. it so that's yeah. amazing and how did you feel yeah. no, did you have nerves or did you just take to it like a duck to water as it were uh no i, pr I probably had nerves um I, and, you know, I still get a little bit of nerves. It's not nervousness, but there's an anxiety before a gig that I think almost every musician feels. I mean, I've been around a couple like Brandon and I always joke about Igor uh, Cavalera and they were on tour with Biohazard and we went to see them at this small club in Virginia and we were just hanging out on the tour bus with I Igor and all of a sudden the tour manager comes in and he goes, OK, it's showtime. And like whatever, he put on some gloves and walked on to, onto the stage and started killing. Like Brand and I were like, "What the hell?" Like no warm up, no you know nothing, uh, just from cold to on fire, and that that was pretty impressive. But uh, you know, over the years, I developed a routine, and uh, it's kind of like an athlete before a game. So if you're doing the same thing before every game, then your biggest game of the year is the same as a preseason or maybe a training match. And that's kind of the, the mentality and mind space that I got into over the years. But my first gig, I was definitely nervous. And I was certainly nervous as a teenager. It was only after doing hundreds or thousands of gigs that it's really become something uh, routine for me. Sure. Sure. So d d tell us about your, your routine then. Um, your sort of like warming up routine. Do you sing or do you, you know, I mean, yeah. different people do different things, right? Some, yeah. some people might do like sit ups or push ups or whatever. And, and some people just do, you know, do scales or whatever. What, what is your routine? But you get on a trampoline, don't you, John? <laughs> I can imagine that. I, I, I did jump rope for a long time because I like hitting the stage with a sweat, but 
I broke my Achilles tendon on stage in the middle of a tour in 2019. And I think maybe the start of it was a jump rope injury uh, that started that. So there's no more jumping rope. But back in the 90s, when we were first getting assigned a roadrunner, I was having vocal trouble. Like we do a weekend gigs, Saturday, Sunday or Friday, Saturday. And the second night I'd have no voice and we were doing gigs with LOA and Mina, who was Keith at the time, was this little person with a massive voice. And if we did a weekender with Life of Agony, he would have a booming voice both nights. I was like, what's the secret? What are you doing? What am I doing wrong? And he turned me on to a fella called Don Lawrence. And Don Lawrence is one of the premier vocal coaches in the world. And at the time, his his claim to fame was like Sebastian Bach and Bon Jovi and things. And that was enough for me. Since then, he's worked with Lady Gaga and uh, some really big names. But Don taught me the basic technique. The guys in Biohazard were, were taking lessons at the time. Um, I encouraged Dave and Scott Mueller, who was playing sax with us, to get lessons. So Don got me on the path of singing the right way and I still do scales that I recorded back in the 90s on a cassette, and now it's a digital file. But it's mm -hmm. always that. There's always an element of uh, maybe not calisthenics, but stretching. I, I travel with a yoga mat. I like to stretch every day, whether I'm home or on tour, just for even 10 minutes helps a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, generally, if I wake up and we're not driving in a van all day, I'll do a stretch early in the morning, and then I'll do one before the show. If there's time, if not, even just some squats or crunches, just something to get the blood moving. I don't want to go on stage like Igor, straight cold. <laughs> I want to have uh, the blood flowing, a little adrenaline. It is something special and it is something to be acknowledged. So I treat it like it's work, but also, you know, we're grateful. The band has a circle before we go on stage. Everybody puts their hands in. Uh, generally I see something, but if somebody has something special on their mind, whether it's a band member or a crew member or somebody who's with us, there's always some sort of dedication. And then we say a word and we release and we go at it. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, I mean, that's great because I mean, obviously you guys have always been known as like a, like an incredible live band. Um, um, so yeah, it's great. It's great to hear like, you know, how you prepare for these shows, you know, it's really cool. It's really I mean, cool. I'd I mean, love I've, to share it. I'll be honest, I've never I've never seen you play live, but um, Perks here has I, seen I, you. So. Well, I have to mention this because I can't help myself but mentioning any Donington show, but I did see you at Donington 96 with yeah. Ozzy, Kiss with the full makeup again. Sephora, right. Corn. Have you got any Bio. of that? Well, yeah, Bio has a fear factory. I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, it, that's, that's it still gets actually. talked about. Uh, inside the band, you know, uh, most of our fans, I would, I think we're most famous for Dynamo 95, but Donington 96 was right up there. That was an incredible time for us. You know, we were riding very high. We had the MTV award, uh, already in our back pocket. We had a UK, uh, top 10. We're on top of the pops. We, you know, we'd done a lot, uh, in Europe, especially, and, that show was just incredible. I remember getting the call from our manager saying Sharon Osborne reached out and she wants us to be a part of it. And we had to cancel, I think it was Rock Am Ring in Germany, which is one of the big, biggest festivals in the world. And uh, we still haven't played it since. I think they're holding a grudge yeah. or something. Oh, you, you had to cancel that to play the Donut in '96. Wow! If, if I remember, you, just, you would never know that, would you? I mean, that's no. yeah. There was there was something like that, you know. And uh, we were like, listen, Ozzy is one of my top three heroes in the world, you know, as far as celebrities or influential people goes. So not only to play that, but the caveat. Uh, that I said I was a, such a cheeky bastard at that time. I, I said <laughs> to uh, our manager, yeah, we'll do the gig, but I need a personal meet and greet with Ozzy to make it happen. And uh, Sharon said, no problem. And uh, I got one. And, you know, the, the boys I didn't get to, but uh, Brandon and Dave and Sean, I think they all got pictures with Kiss because they rolled in in full costume for their meet and greet. 
uh, or not meet and greet their, their press session. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the boys saw them like all pop out of the car and Gene and Paul were real, were real gracious and like, uh, let them shake hands and take pictures. But, uh, they said Peter, Chris and Ace were like dicks and didn't want to get involved with anybody. Oh, really? Yeah. Who knows? You know, there, there was a lot going on. Uh, I also remember we were billed to go on after Biohazard. If you look at the poster, it says Biohazard and Dog the Dog is above. But because those guys had done so much for us and helped us get off the ground, we said, no, uh, today feels right that we play before you guys. And that was like a gesture to them. And we said, look, this is uh, this is for today. In the future, you know, if we got to play after you, we're, we're down to do it. But for tonight, you know, we, we want to get honor you guys and, and say that uh, we're giving you that spot. Awesome. And yeah, I think that cool. was when, when um, unfortunately, Max didn't turn up with the separate yeah. and they played without him. But yeah, I had met Dana, I met Dana the summer before in uh, in Dynamo because Nail Bomb was playing. And if you've seen Max, you know that he doesn't uh, travel by himself. There's always a, a circus uh, with Gloria leading the charge and the rest and uh, yeah, it was very sad, and I'm proud of those guys that they were able to play. Uh, backstory that you might not know is that Sharon Osbourne gave them uh, the plane to use uh, the band or the family. I forget what happened, but I think Max was in Europe and had to fly home, him and Gloria. So they left, and that was a special gig for everybody. But you think about it, if you just look at the lineup on the side stage, it was, like, incredible. I think Typo Negative, Corn. Yeah. Uh, who was ever clear was on that a fear factory it was just insanity like all those bands went on to be huge names in metal almost so yeah 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 special exactly. time I, I love that gig you know i wore my irish jersey uh as a salute to my to my family and my uh my heritage so yeah i mean that that entire day was unforgettable and uh i hope those memories stay with me forever I'm sure they I've will, still mate. got the T-shirt from that day, and it's not official. It was a bootleg one. That I bought. But I don't care. I've still got it. It still looks just as good. Damn right, especially if it's a festival shirt. A bootleg is a okay in my book. Yeah, it's just a little bit. Yeah, we... it's not as good condition as uh, as, a, as an official one, but it looks better. I think. Bootleg. I've one. never seen. Uh, I've never seen a full uh, movie from that day, but I think there were cameras. I know Roadrunner paid to have that set recorded and i've heard that i def like brandon has that on cassette or cd so uh dog dog live at donnington uh, it definitely exists in the archives yeah no, that's amazing. Always, i mean i'm a bit of a total nerd with this stuff but I, I really want like all the old donnington footage like in hd on fucking blu-rays and shit but yeah be so. i, I know. want it all but it ain't it's not available yeah. all you can watch so, is, like, youtube sort of grainy versions of yeah, it yeah. it's so true isn't it you know, with good uh, sound. Since, uh, sorry to interrupt. Since you were there and you're you're geeking out about it, I'll give you a little <laughs> story that that I shared the other day because the uh, the man in the interview asked me about Dio, and since we recorded the song with him and it's on the album, our dream was we wanted to have Ronnie come out and sing the national anthem the American national anthem in the UK. And then we opened the set with games with Dio joining us on stage. But uh, Sharon kiboshed the idea. She was like, no Dio, no dice. <laughs> She's a nightmare. And she, you hear That's so many things. Terrible. You hear about her telling bands, like they've got to cut their hair or they've got to dress differently and all this kind of stuff. Oh, she proper lays the yeah, I know. Down, she? Uh, I still want to yeah, podcast yeah. though. Sharon? Sharon? <laughs> the invite Get said? her on. She has more her. stories than anybody. She reminds me of my auntie. Right. My auntie's like that. Very like powerful kind of just no shit woman. You know, I grew up with that woman. I grew up. With uh, oh, yeah. I, I'd love to have her for an auntie, but I, I wouldn't love to have her for a wife. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> or manager. Yeah. I mean, God bless Ozzy. He must have the, you know, he must, he must be quite chilled out to, to live. You know? Oh, my God. Uh, Ozzy was a was a total wreck that day, and I won't go into personal details. 
Uh, when I met him, he couldn't even speak anymore, but I knew he could hear what <laughs> I was saying because uh, because of what he wrote. And I'll keep that one personal. But I thought Ozzy was done. And this was even before the Osbournes TV show or anything. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. incredible that he was even like got his shit together for that because he was a total mess that day uh, at Donington. And one of my takeaways from that day was like, holy shit, like take it easy on lifestyle choices because, and there's no, nobody in our band lived as hard as Ozzy and the stories, that's for sure. Mm. But it also gave me fair warning and to see it's up to, you know, a, a mess. So <laughs> Go bless gave me the man. hubris to say, listen, keep, Keep your uh, demons in check. Yeah, yeah, sure. And sure. then he's managed to uh, go on for decades after that. Yeah, after decades that after I know. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. crazy. Up, you know? <laughs> bless him, bless him. Long may he reign. God bless Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> so like let's talk some more about Doggy Dog then. I mean, um, we hear you've got a new record coming out. Yeah. What we can just, you tell we, us? We just listened to the. Well, I listened to him in the car the other day, but the two tracks are available yeah. to us. I yeah, mean, there might be more in the US, but there's two. Thank you. No, um, they're they're worldwide. Everything's on oh, YouTube, on Spotify. Yeah. Yep, we're the, we the signed with a small yeah. label, and two of the four singles are out now. And then we have two more coming before the record drops. Uh, mm -hmm. The third one comes this this Friday uh, coming up. Lit, lit nice, up, nice. I think, is probably as good as anything you've done. I think it's a great, Thank you. great catchy little yeah. track, and you know, and it's got some riffage in it, and it's it, and it's got the dog eat dog different styles throughout. Well, right, I, I think that uh, the the singles, especially the first three that you're going to hear, are what people who are familiar with dog eat dog would expect from us in 2023. I think uh -huh. we. We've updated our sound to go along with the times. We're trying to keep a, a balance between our live energy and also the, the studio tools that are available in uh, in this day and age. But the songs were created and recorded over a five-year period with a little pandemic break. So we, re we really started in 2017 and we only finished it uh, basically, last summer we finished tracking it, but it took a long time to get it mixed and and uh, and out to the world. But it's almost out in the world, and we're very excited. I mean, we feel like a new band again with a 30-year history yeah. because Brilliant. I think there's enough on the album that's going to make somebody who was familiar and like Doggy Dog over the years, I think they're going to hear something they like. And I think there's also some adventurous and new territory in this material. And we're not the same band that we were 25 years ago. Uh, lyrically, thematically, uh, as a vocalist, I've come a long way from uh, 1994 and All Borough Kings. And I think the new album showcases all that. But it's still got the elements of what made Doggy Dog uh, to start out with in 1990. Amazing. Well, we can't wait to hear it. And is that that's coming out in October? You're releasing all the tracks. Yeah, all the tracks come out October twentieth, and uh, "Man's Best Friend," which is the third single, that's coming out this Friday, fifteenth, sixteenth. Yeah, I'm looking at my calendar over there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and then the fourth single is something very different, and that's coming out um, three weeks from then so it's uh, sometime in october end of september right before the album comes out yeah i think it's early october and that's called bar down and i think if you never heard doggy dog before and you heard that song and you went back in time you'd be like is this the same band uh so there's 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 definitely some adventurous material on the record um but yeah it's just who we are right now is there uh, great, any collaborations great. on the album, John? Or you don't want to there say is, that? yeah. We we have um there's a few friends. There's a an artist named Heartbeat from DC who was on our ninety-nine album and he also sang on our two thousand and six release Walk With Me. So 
Amped and Walk With Me are kind of like the lost doggy dog records. You know, uh, Amped was our last one with Roadrunner in 99. And that didn't get a full worldwide release because of uh, legal issues. And then in 2006, we made an album called Walk With Me that was self-released. It never made it into stores. Uh, it's kind of hard to find, but uh, Heartbeat was on us on those two records with us on one track each. And he performs on this album, Percussion and Vocal. And then kind of the household name that we have on the album is uh, Rude Boy from Urban Dance Squad. And Urban Dance Squad was a big influence on Dave and Sean and I when we started Dog Eat Dog. Not so much that we wanted to sound like them, but we love their adventurousness and the way that their music held no boundaries. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was a guest. I got him uh, to rap on the track Mean Street. And we're really excited about that. I mean, we've got Dan Astazi, our old friend, helping out on backup vocals and his his dudes in Kings Never Die. Uh, Dan, Danny Biohazard sings backup on the record. Uh, a really good friend of the band's, Rachel Flotart, uh, adds her voice to the last song, Zamboni. And that's another one where if you heard it, you would not believe it's Dog Eat Dog. But uh, we're proud of it. I, I think it's a great song. Her voice adds so much more depth to the song. And I already like the song to begin with. So, you know, a Doggy Dog album is like a Doggy Dog uh, live show. There's always going to be some friends involved uh, if they're around or accessible. And this album definitely was a family affair. We have one of our longtime sax players from New York City, uh, Paul Vercesi, joins us. Uh, our current guy from Prague, Czech Republic, Bozis, plays on on a couple of songs. And of course, I can't talk about the new album without mentioning Roger Hammerly, who this is uh, his second recording with us. And he did a fantastic job. He came with the goods. I'm so proud of the guitar work on this album. And I think this is our best material ever. I think we're all at the peak of our powers right now. We might not uh, be as energetic as we were in our 20s and early 30s, but I think the wisdom and experience is paying off, and I think the music reflects that. Of course, yeah. Well, like I say, we can't wait to hear it. But, I mean, um, how could you not want to hear that? Album yeah. After that speech and run yeah. through of the album. And thank the you, guests, thank you, man. And the guests, you know what I mean? So, um, the whole coding, recording, you said that obviously you started writing during lockdown, etc. cetera, but um, the whole kind of recording how do you work as a band do you like send each other ideas or do you get all get together in a studio how does it work uh the truth is it works mostly the old-fashioned way it mm -hmm. works every different kind of way we're, yeah. we're not closed off to any process uh and and the album reflects pretty much a, a, a lot of different ways songs came together but mm -hmm. the traditional thing for us was to get in a room and, you know, have a few beers, maybe smoke a spliff and, you know, stand close to each other, feel the music, feel the energy, uh, talk about stuff, eat a pizza, whatever it is. It's like kind of just getting in the same space. Sharing space is big for us. Yeah. People, um, I had lyrics to share. Roger had guitar riffs. Dave had guitar or bass riffs. Uh, I had certain tempos in mind. One of the things that I really wanted to do on this record was make sure that we had a vi variety of tempos and moods because nice. I thought one thing that we lacked in our live set was some slower songs. And proper headlining bands that I watch you know, that play an hour and 20 or 90 minutes, you, they can take you on a ride from different feelings, different tempos. So for this album, I had at least two or three ideas that I really wanted to slow things down and try that vibe. And mm -hmm. it, I think it really worked. And we also have a couple of bangers. Like we have a song on here that's like kind of pure thrash uh, with a little... Uh, dubstep breakdown in the middle so it's mixing the 80s with the 2000s but it's 190 beats per minute and you know it's kicking You're so the more. album can swing yeah the album can swing from like almost 200 to like 50 
And that was important for me. But basically, yeah, we, we, we started getting in the room together. What basically happened was once we decided we were going to make the record and we were going to move forward with the producer in Switzerland, who also did our brand new breed EP, which is up on all the streaming channels, but it basically is four songs. We, pr we produced it in 2015, released it ourselves in 2016, and then Metalville put it out in 2017. They, re they reissued our EP. And Metalville wanted a record from us, and we already had started writing. So in 2017, in between festivals, we'd play like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, maybe Sunday, and then we'd have days off in between. So we would go into friends of ours in the Czech Republic. In Prague, they have a rehearsal space. So it just happened to be most of the time we ended up in Prague, and we'd go into a room and write these ideas down or not write them down. I'd record them with my phone, as simple as you can get, just like we used to do with a boom box in the 90s. I'd record almost everything. And then I'd sort through it. Sometimes we would have enough of a song. We'd have two or three parts and I'd have a chorus right away. We'd write a song on a Wednesday. And by Friday, we were trying it out on stage. Like I would freestyle lyrics or for one song, I used REM lyrics to the end of the world as we know it, which 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 became Time Won't Wait. But I like those verses, the cadence. So there, we would write a song and then basically play it on the weekend. And that's how it happened in 2017, 2018, 2019. And then we were getting ready to finish the record in 2020, but the lockdown hit. Yeah. So we were kind of on pause. Not that much happened gave us all the time to listen to what we had and it gave me a lot of time to write lyrics and refine lyrics and write melodies and really get my shit together under no time pressure and that was helpful honestly mm -hmm. um besides the whatever the world and political and social ramifications as a band it actually gave us a little bit of time so we hit the stage again in 2021 and we finished off these ideas that I had been listening to for a year and a half that I already had verses or choruses or different things. We were able to get back in a room. Uh, we had like three or four shows that were canceled and we stayed in Prague and we worked on the songs that we kind of had half finished and we started some newer songs. And I think that time gave us really the freedom to finalize the songs and really know what we wanted. And fortunately, then we had two live gigs. So like the first version of Never Give In, which is the single that's out now, I have on my phone. And it was electrifying. I mean, the first time that I had lyrics to sing and the breakdown in the middle with the crowd. And we all were just like, we had goosebumps, like, you know, the hair standing up on your arm from the gig and the crowd did too. And like to see people singing along with a song, the first fucking time you play it properly was just like, okay, this is, we're doing the right thing here. And it was just, that gave us kind of the confidence to know that we were on the right path. Like these songs were something special. And even like last winter when everything was tracked and we were fighting, like, are we cutting songs off the record and everything? And we just decided, look, all of these songs, these 14 songs lasted five years. Most of them have, have been played live. We're not cutting anything off. Mm -hmm. There's other ideas that are unfinished. So it's not like, you know, those are the only 14 songs we had, but they all stood the test of time and we, we believed in them. And, and that's why the record is the way it is because it wasn't a rush job, you know, no. Uh, one of the songs <laughs> at Joe's is a, a, a song idea that I had in 98 and 99 when we were writing the Amped record. And it finally, 25 years later, saw the light of day as a song. So, you know, we've been we've been almost waiting our whole life to write this record. It's like All Borough Kings in a way like there's we've had so much time that it almost is like a brand new second chapter for the band. Yeah, I mean that's the thing, isn't it? Like most bands, like when when you when you play your first album, you've had 
when you record your first album, you've had like years or however long of playing those your songs. whole life. Exactly that. And then as soon as you hit that that cycle of record, uh, release an album tour, it, it must be so hard to like find time to like write new stuff and and you know it is yeah a hundred percent yeah but you guys yeah. obviously managed it which is which is well cool. we have a unique path you know we went through the that cycle okay all Borough kings came out and then all uh play games was like hey can you top that you know you guys went from nothing to mtv award winners you traveled the world now there's expectations luckily for us we had the success gave us even more swagger and more uh, confidence to mm. call Dio, to get RZA from Wu-Tang on the record. I mean, nobody at Roadrunner except people in bands knew who Wu-Tang was. I promise you that in 1996. Yeah. No, so, man. yeah, so th those things were, you know, there was, there was pressure there. And I think, you know, we still came out with, rocky with isms you know step right in with with singles and also an album that reflected where the band was at the time i'm, I'm very proud of that material um and then amped was even harder because yeah we had success and now it was like okay can you do it a third time and we broke up with the label we broke up with our manager uh it almost pulled the band apart it was a very stressful album and it took more than a year to make, but we learned so much. And what didn't kill us made us stronger. And I'll spare the band history, but basically from 99 until now, we've been doing our own thing as a mm -hmm. part-time band. Yeah. And not having the economic pressure to sell records or sell tickets for shows has given us this freedom to do music just for fun and i think just because we've been doing it for fun for half of our career now let's say the last 15 or 16 years it we have a freedom that not a lot of bands have because they're under the pressure to sell and to go on tour and make records and i think that can reflect in your creativity and your energy levels and just your process mm -hmm. so having 15 or 20 years to write a record is the reason why i feel like we're a new band again Amazing. so you guys you basically when when it kind of dropped off a bit you you all got regular jobs right and then you just do yeah this, you, you, you can just take a like accept a a festival date accept a, a, a tour but it is not going to impact your life as such well, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. Right, okay. So sometimes please finish. No, no, sometimes you're gonna if you if you get a tour, you how do you leave your day to day existence? And then obviously with a festival you can just fly out for the weekend. Am, am I right in that? And you can come back yeah. and it's like, did it happen? But no, you're gonna tour Germany, aren't you? So imminently. So you're gonna have to leave yeah. leave what you normally do and then do that and then come back. But at the same time, you haven't got, like you say, pressure. you don't have to sell all this to survive. Yeah. Mm. Yep, so. exactly. And I think that's also benefited us in making the record that, you know, there's not pressure to be on MTV or stay on MTV or, or get on some tour or get in the charts or anything. We're able to create from a pure place with no stress, the label, waited five years for the album like they probably thought it was never going to come it's not like they gave us a hundred thousand dollars like roadrunner did in the 90s or something but at the same time there there's nobody telling us what to do other than us and that gives you freedom and it also puts the responsibility on you because there's nobody to blame you mm -hmm. know if if our album doesn't sell or it's not successful I won't say it's the record company's fault. I'll just be like, hey, it just wasn't our time or we didn't reach the right people at the right time. There's so much luck involved and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I will say this. I mean, it's not the ideal scenario because if you're not 100% committed to music, right, then 
whatever's going on at home, your jobs, your, your relationships, your interests, they also suffer and they don't get the equal attention that it would if you were just doing that. So Dave, myself, Brandon, Roger, our crew uh, that travel with us, everybody makes a sacrifice to make dog eat dog happen. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's lucrative enough that we're not losing money to do it. We we wouldn't do that. But we also, we never broke up. We never quit. We just, we answer the phone when people call and they want us to play. And we go if it makes sense for everybody. And we feel like we're going to have a good time. And it's that kind of energy that led us to making a record because when we're on stage and we're sharing that type of vibe, people can't help notice that we're a little bit different than a lot of the bands that they're seeing. You know, when we're, especially if we're at like a metal or a rock festival or, or a hardcore festival, like so much of the music is similar and so much of the vibe is similar and people love that. That's the reason why they're in that, that lane and they're at that show. Mm-hmm. But then we come on and there's like, you know, saxophones and positivity and melody and everything. And it's like, and our energy is different too, because we're not like, you know, we don't have to pay a massive tour bus bill or, you know, we don't have all this production. We're just like, we barely even have a backdrop, but the lights and the backdrop and whatever doesn't make your show, you know, outshine us if we got the right, you know, energy we feel on stage. So I think, you know, besides being a little bit oddball in no matter what show we're at or, you know, what presentation we also come across, we have a different feel and a different energy than a lot of bands. Mm. No, a hundred percent. But it goes back to what I said earlier, like your, you you know, the, the way the fans love your live shows and the way everyone talks about your live shows. I mean, you know, that, that's, that sets the standard i mean that's you know m- most people when they talk about bands they're like oh, yeah you know i like this album i like this album whatever but um you guys have always been known for your live show right and but you've also you've always put that energy and your live show has come across in the albums as well which i think is a very hard thing to do a lot of bands struggle to get that that sound the live sound on an album but um you guys have always you know always always managed that so well you know well thank you we, we do our best and I feel like the production and the sound on the new record matches what's going on in the, in the world right now, musically, Mm -hmm. um, as far as what, what people should expect to hear. But we also, you're right. It's hard to capture, uh, live energy. And back in the nineties, it was even harder when you had tape and somewhat of a sterile studio environment and now people mm-hmm. are making records in their bedrooms you know or out in the garage or whatever yeah and sure. that's great the accessibility and the 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 affordability of the equipment is fantastic mm. but i think with that technology comes a instinct to sanitize and make everything perfect because that's what the standard is and Perfect and sanitized is not always good. It's, you know, it's sometimes the imperfection Mm -hmm. uh, where the energy is or a little bit of noise or the feeling of a guitar, you know, squeaking across the fretboard is what, where the magic is. So you got to be careful to to acknowledge. And I think one of the things for us too, is like, I literally, I had no clue what I was doing in a vocal booth until we made the amps record and the producer there gave a shit enough about me and the band and our songs to to keep saying no it's not good enough make it more interesting write better lyrics sing better you know all these things and it crushed me at the time but it broke me down and built me back up into a version of myself where I could walk into any studio in the world or sing in somebody's closet and know what I'm hearing and know how to get uh, my best performance. So it takes time, no matter how good your equipment is, to, to learn sometimes. And the flip side of that is 
sometimes youthful energy and inexperience is where all the magic happens too. I mean, people love All Borough Kings to this day, and I've heard people trash our new music and say they love the old shit better. And the old album, you know, All Borough Kings has a unique quality because of the mistakes on it and because of the noise and stuff blowing up and, you know, hitting the red markers and, and going over. But listen, I wouldn't change a thing from then and from now. It's all supposed to be how it is. And I love it. Yeah. I mean, there's so many fans out there that like say they love a band, but then like, uh, like the, the biggest example I can think of is probably, like Metallica, like people say they're like the biggest Metallica fans in the world, but they only like the first three albums. It's like, come on, bands change. Do you know what I mean? Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> so, Listen, oh. that's the only stuff. That's the only stuff that that I'll put on. Yeah, myself. But I, I love it all, and I respect the hell out of Metallica. Yeah, but I mean, like, like in chat rooms and stuff, people will just people will say they're a massive fan, but they'll just completely slag off anything like past the black album they're like it's shit it's shit it's like well you're not that and much of a fan then really. find out they're born after the black album even came out okay yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah john you're not at you're, least i could say away with that you, 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 you <laughs> no no i lived, tell me uh, you don't like the black album come on please no i live i lived ride the lightning master of puppets uh, I, I, I wasn't a fan of kill them all, but of course I went back into it. But like, I remember when the ride, the lightning came out and master of puppets, like I bought that cassette and just was like every single liner note. I mean, the pages of it, when you open that cassette is <laughs> ridiculous, but Hey, I, I know cause I saw them live then and I lived it. So I have a right to say I'm not a fan of certain albums. Of, of theirs, course. But, I know. I get that. Yeah. I get that. I do get yeah. that. But I got to but say. Also don't, I also don't slag them off just for that. They have to, of course, evolve and move on. Yeah. And as a fan, I'm not the 17 year old kid that I was, you know, when uh, whatever black album came out or something like, you know, 54 now like my taste have changed but i gave the new album a chance i listened to it a couple times i was and gonna I think say there's the a lot new of... album there's a lot of good stuff on there yeah I yeah, it. yeah. There's, there's an old school vibe to it for sure yeah 100 yeah. percent. saying that i'm just as bad as you because i don't like load that album so i yeah. like load and reload but no. i like i like a lot of southern, sort of southern rock and all that uh, kind of stuff so no. that that's kind cool of, I, I love that too i mean Sean Kilkenny was a big fan of Load and Reload and he used to try and shove it down my throat and I'd be like, dude, <laughs> I wouldn't do not us. happening. <laughs> as much as I, I want to keep talking about Metallica, John, yeah. why have you never done a solo hip-hop rap album? Hmm. Um, there's been forays into uh you know, features, let's say, on uh, with other artists. My buddy Heartbeat that I was speaking about, uh, who, who's accompanied Doggy Dog on, on many albums and tracks, and he, he toured with us for a while, singing backups and doing percussion. He's an amazing producer, singer, comedian, and everything. And him and I had this project where we worked on it. I, you know, I can't say that I haven't worked on material uh, in that direction, but I never really thought that's where I wanted to go. And even when like Sean and Dave and Danny and they did like All Burl Kings, which is essentially doggy dog without me, <laughs> uh, you know, I wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to do my own thing now. Like I chose not to be a part of that band. Those guys asked me to do it and I just wasn't interested in revisiting the past uh, mm -hmm. in that way. But yeah, to answer your question, I don't I'm not really sure why it's never been a huge goal of mine to like shine on my own and honestly I I love being part of a team and a family and even more so now gone through making free radicals and I mean I basically wrote every word on the record every melody you know song titles all of that was mine and, you know, the boys chimed in here and there, certainly, um, but they gave me the freedom and uh, gave me the ability to, to speak for everybody. 
And what I also realized is I had very strong ideas about every song on the album, but once Roger and Dave or Brandon or Matt, our producer, put their two cents in, it always elevated the song. So I feel like when I collaborate, I always work better than just my raw ideas on my own. Even with the artwork or whatever, like I, you know, I came up with the title. I directed the artwork, even though Dave did an incredible job translating my ideas and, and we shared a lot of ideas. I work better when my ideas are filtered through people that I love and trust. And I might not have known that my whole career, but I know it now. Hmm. I just think it would have been cool. You doing an out and out hip hop. Rap I'm not rap. dead yet. <laughs> it could happen. Well, so we go with it. <laughs> there's there's still a chance. But but if I'm being honest, when you, when I you have... get flowing, you know, on, on certain tracks when you really get flowing and it, it is that kind of that hip hop style, I think you, you well could have done that. And yeah, have... and, and and thank you for saying that. And and I still can, but truth being told. Right now in my life, I have more of a interest in working on like traditional Irish music or, you know, really folk kind of in that uh, vein mm -hmm. uh, and not Dropkick Murphys or any of this rock and Irish movement, which is fine. Not my thing, but I don't hate it. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like real traditional instruments. That to me is way more uh, what I'm feeling nowadays and stuff that I'm thinking about than rap. But I'm always rapping. I'm always coming up with song titles. I'm always coming up with lyrics and melodies. And nowadays I just spit them in my phone. And sometimes I have a category for them. And sometimes I don't. And I just leave them in the free radical box uh but the other thing that i'm i'm really that i'm putting out in the universe is i said when we finish this record that the next project that i really wanted to do at least one time was try stand-up comedy in my life and uh i'm committed to that so in the next year or maybe two years uh, I, I want to at least try it. And I think if I do it once that I'll like doing it and I want to just try that out. Wow. Wow. So you've got, you've, you've got material written down for that, right? Is it start, um, is it not so much written, just... but I'm starting. Yeah. The thing is, Subjects too, that after... you want to approach to make fun. Kind of. Yeah. At the moment, I just have the, uh, enormous self-confidence to think that a, I'm funny and B, I know that I'm comfortable on stage in front of people with a mic in my hand. A lot of what I do in between songs is just basically try and be funny while the guys are tuning and, you know, having a sip of beer. So uh, I kind of think that I, I, I know I can do it. I'm not saying I'm going to be funny, but I've, I've done a few like uh, ukulele shows on my own. So... I feel like I'm not afraid to perform without the band. Well, that's amazing. But that's great yeah. because I mean, obviously, as a band, you've like worked together for like like a massive part of your lives. And I'm sure you're all like brothers, etc. But sometimes we you're are. gonna you're gonna you're gonna need time away from each other as well, right? And I'm sure the other guys also have their own little niches and hobbies and things that they do outside the band as well. Absolutely. I mean, Dave's released two solo or uh, uh, release multiple solo uh ventures out into the audio world in his soundtrack music mm -hmm. brandon is a full-time working drummer he plays in church he plays with other artists locally when he's not doing dog eat dog roger has his own band which is wonderful called the hidden with a y and two d's i recommend metalheads to check that out uh it's a duo so we're all doing different things and the the allowance and the acceptance and the ability to not be jealous of our other band members expressing themselves, I think is one of the keys to success yeah. for our longevity 100%. that we've no, nobody's been held back. 
we only do dog eat dog when everybody has time and commits to it. So we're not forcing this down anyone's throat, including our crew. Everybody's got a choice of whether they want to be involved and the partnership and the sense of community that we get out of it is incredible. It's really, it's a second or third family, fourth family for people, depending on what they have going on in their lives. And uh, yeah, I think that freedom has really been what's kept us alive so long. Yeah. What do you think um, has been the absolute, highlight of dog eat dog's career if you had to if you had to choose one thing one point one thing you achieve one show if you can only say one i mean can you yeah like for me personally we've had great gigs great moments you know holy shits uh the bad brains you know not only touring with them and meeting our our idols but 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 getting Daryl on a record and and becoming friends with them and things like that. But for me, the little kid who was riding his bike, delivering newspapers on a Sunday morning, and I had my headphones on, I'm listening to rock radio, and I heard Paranoid, and I hear Ozzy's voice wailing. I just, you know, there was something that struck a chord in me that made a huge imprint on me. And then uh, sit you know, in a trailer with Ozzy at Donington Grounds and just sitting across from the man, you know, himself was just like, you know, and it was so, like I said, it was, he was a mess. It was so fucking sad too. (laughs) Like it, it broke my heart, but it also was like, I made it, you know, like at that moment, I not only made myself proud, but like I made my family proud. You know what I mean? Like maybe winning the MTV award, that was a big deal. Cause like that was something that I could share and we could share with everybody. Mm-hmm. Not cause like MTV, whatever, but it's like just on a level of big, but my personal high water mark was like sitting there with Ozzy and like, on, on that bill. On, yeah, just, yeah. just no sitting it literally sitting in a room with him. Like, okay. Like, this is like because this this band gave me this access to sit with really a a god to me you know mm-hmm. he might have been a fallen god in my eyes that day too it's really complicated what happened emotionally for me so, in a sorry, lot of ways interrupt but... you, John. was this before no problem they went before us he did his set or after Ozzy no it his was set? it was after like after he his... had literally yeah okay, he yeah. he had sung he had done the meet and greet, I was literally the last person that he had to deal with for that day. And I thought yeah, he was promise. totally, yeah, I thought he was totally checked out, but he heard me. Who was his guitarist in 96 then? Was that Zach Wild? I think it was Zach. Yeah. 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 Like I didn't even really care about the gig. Like it was cool watching Ozzy, but like mm. I'd seen him before multiple times and, yeah. you know, it wasn't about that. But uh, seeing Kiss was kind of cool. I remember that I went into the crowd because I'd never seen Kiss with makeup before. I saw them like in the 80s when they were like animal eyes and that stuff. But yeah, yeah, like seeing Kiss with makeup from the crowd was like real important to me. And I remember just like, you know, walking around and people were like, aren't you like, (laughs) how come you're not watching it from the stage? I'm like, it's doesn't it wouldn't mean as much watching it from the I'd, I'd never seen yeah. them okay so the first time i ever saw them was in full makeup their reunion show that show yeah and yeah i wasn't massively into them you know yeah so all the lower bands on the bill fear factory and all that dog eat dog but right Ron and all that obviously aussie kiss like blimey it's amazing yeah and then i saw yeah. kiss you know that makeup do the full show with the fire breathing and the blood and the jeep i was just like Holy shit! This, <laughs> these, these, this is like the pinnacle of a live show. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was fucking amazing. Yeah. I mean, I've I've seen a lot of bands in my in my years, but I've always said the best live band I've seen is Kiss. And again, I'm not a huge, huge fan of Kiss, but I stood and watched them, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. 
Like yeah. One of one of them it, flew above my head and landed landed on 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 the sound desk. Like I, was, I didn't know what was happening. There was fireworks going off. There was blood going everywhere. That was 2015, right. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that 2015, was 2015. Really yeah. So he finally saw them, yeah. and yeah. I, I'd seen them. So they were still that good decades after. Yeah, it's insane. Well, it it's also it's so much too about where your head's at and where your expectations at with any gig, right? So like. If you're like, okay, I like, I only go to hardcore shows and you go to Kiss, you're probably not going to be like wowed by any of this flying circus shit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because you're used to the immediacy of, you know, danger, getting spit on, get sweat flying everywhere, you know, the whole thing. So you're in this arena and then it's like, oh, that this isn't really that impressive. But for a band like Kiss, especially in 2015, like, it's not as important like that they're singing everything or they're playing their own instruments at that point. Really, it's more to me like something you'd see on Broadway yeah. than what you'd see, yeah. you know, what you expect a live gig to be. Mm -hmm. But we played not last summer, but uh, summer before 22, we played Grass Pop and we were playing on a smaller stage later on and I had never seen Alice Cooper before and he was literally like playing right there. So I was like, let me walk out just so I can same thing, just see it in the crowd, feel the energy. He's got great musicians with him. And yeah. I was blown away. Just his show, the showmanship, yeah. how much stuff was going on. And this wasn't like kiss level flying people, but just mm -hmm. the production and the effort and the musicianship was so high quality that I was like, that was one of my favorite performances that I saw that year. And yeah. I didn't expect it. I just wanted to check out a legend and see him before he, you know, maybe died or whatever. It was like my yeah. mentality. I'm here. Let me live in this moment and uh, whatever it was. And I really ended up loving it. So yeah, sometimes yeah. when you're in the right headspace, the right show, there's nothing better. No, that's right. And like you say, um, I think he is, he's got, he's got, or well, he had quite a, young band and everything didn't he and they were all amazing musicians did he have um i can't remember her name the guitarist is it or, or, Athene or something yeah that was one of I her mean, last gigs incredible guitarist like wow but he had like three guitar yeah. players <laughs> yeah three yeah, yeah. Guitar players like i think there was two drummers out there it was like a, a zoo of humans but it was incredible. Then he was playing guitar as well. So there was like four or five guitars at one point. Good but the God. thing was, it still sounded good. Yeah. Yeah. And then like what the opposite side of that is this like Hollywood vampire shit. And I'm like, does the world really need this? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm glad people enjoy it. But like, you could not pay me to go see those guys <laughs> do that. No, no, it's a bit of a strange one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> my brother put that on uh we was having a drink and my brother put hollywood vampires on youtube like mm. a live performance and i'll tell you what it was it was all right <laughs> yeah it's probably it's like, probably like the best cover band you've ever seen yeah, but i mean it was just like <laughs> yeah this is all right man. <laughs> so, yeah. there you go no no judgment <laughs> No, there's there's something for guys, everybody. Like you say, like we go we actually go and see hardcore shows still. We did a couple this year. Yeah. But we we kind of we're a bit weird in the way we 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 like anything from hardcore right up to the pinnacle of fear like Kiss and Alice Cooper, whatever the whole spectrum. Yeah, that's just I don't know I've never really gone into one actual scene and been like that's my scene, you know. Like I think metal was probably my defining scene, but we like it all, don't we? Yeah, yeah. I love that. Maybe that's why we're talking. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, we've got a a weird question we ask everyone. Hit me. It's another one of those. You've only got one, John. But um, <laughs> we always say, always say to someone, you you can send a song into space for any other life forms to hear. Mm. But it can only be one. So kind of your favorite song or one kind you think you, anyone would enjoy out there. It or... will define the whole of our planet mm. to anybody who would hear it. But some people don't care about whether it defines the planet. They just go with a favorite. Yeah. And then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I can dig it. On the top of my head, uh, I've said many times, so it's no secret that I think Bob Marley uh, is the most incredible artist uh, that that I've 
seen in my lifetime that that I've witnessed and I love his music. I love the way that it still resonates uh, from the 70s in 2023. The lyrics are still, unfortunately, um, more important than ever. And his message of peace and connecting people, I think, is truly even transcends music and maybe puts him in the level of uh, a modern prophet. So I will say uh, War by Bob Marley. Uh, Everywhere is war is basically the chorus. And that's what I want the universe to hear because we need more peace and less war. I like that. I that think that's a great same. choice. We've had some strange ones over the, over the last couple of years. Word spoken as well. That is, that is hey. definitely a good choice. Yes, you're yes. Not the, you're, not the, you're not the first person to pick Bob Marley, I believe. Am I right? Oh, who else? Jesse uh, Leach. Yeah, Jesse Kill, Leach Kill and Kill Switch Engage. He chose Bob Marley. Nice one. I love what that. What song did he choose? Was it No Woman, No Cry? No, it wasn't. Uh, one Love. Maybe. One Love. Yeah, it was One Love. Yeah, you're right. But yeah, hey, that, there, e- easily man. that 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 could have that could have been uh, my choice as well. And literally, if you take One Love and War, I mean, there's no better example of Bob Marley and his lyrics being so important and so uh, it, it defines the human experience in my opinion the good and bad of it and that's incredible i really think he had such a gift especially the words that he wrote Mm -hmm. and the uh just the depth of his voice you know he could sing from a whisper to a wail in just such a cool way yeah yeah 100 percent, amazing um john just before you go we're gonna let you go Mm -hmm. because you've just yeah everything can be absolutely amazing um you're starting the tour when does it start where is it and what people are going to follow you on is it you mainly on facebook mainly instagram doggy dog on everything aren't they right uh so far we're we're instagram is kind of our main hub that connects with the facebook uh with our new single man's best friend what we did was we invited fans from around the world to submit clips of their dogs because the song is Uh, The chorus is, I love my dogs, man's best friend. So it's going to be very much a fan kind of uh, submitted and collaborative video. So we're launching our TikTok as well with the song. So we're going to be on TikTok as well. Uh, I do hold a Doggy Dog official Twitter account, but no offense to anybody who likes Twitter, but I don't really like that platform. And I don't think I'm going to... If, if Doggy Dog has a Twitter, it's just going to be a shadow of one of our other accounts. I, I don't, you won't, you won't see me interacting there, uh, but you will catch me at the YouTube uh, when the videos are released. I like to do a, a chats and, and talk to people. And believe it or not, I don't care what people say, good or bad, but I like to read the comments on our stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think some of the nastier ones are hilarious. So you're, you're not going to like, you're definitely not going to get into a war with me. Um, it's but uh, <laughs> if people are looking for that, but uh, no, we love the socials. Um, I love the interactivity, the immediacy. I mean, we do a gig, you see follows right away. You see the DMs coming in. People want to share their experiences, their videos, uh, their photos, whatever it is. I, I think that's amazing. Like if I had something like that as a kid it would have been too much for me to handle, you know, because I was getting all my inf- information from like Hit Parader and Cream Magazine and that's it. I didn't even know about NME and Melody Maker and stuff back then. So yeah, jumped off track a little bit there, right. but the, the singles are coming out. Um, at, the new one's coming this Friday. We're on the socials. We've got the tour is starting a week after the album comes out, we're starting in Hamburg, Germany. We're, we've got Grove Street from the UK, uh, formerly known as Grove Street Families. Those guys are going to be on the tour with us. And Dan Anastasi from Kings Never Die, our longtime collaborator and friend. He's got his new band. They're also on Metalville. So we're going for like three or four weeks in Europe. Unfortunately, we're not hitting the UK. But I am talking right now with uh, with some booking contacts and uh some bands right now and we definitely want to make uk and hopefully ireland a focus in 2024 and also hit some places like paris 
and Spain and some other cities that we aren't able to hit on this first run. Uh, mm-hmm. We'd like to go back to and hit in 2024. Amazing. Awesome. Is it too late to get my dog in the video? Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately it is. Yeah, he's already he's already I follow the social media. Oh. You gotta follow the socials, man. <laughs> but here's this. Here's this. Once the TikTok account is launched and the single is available like on TikTok as music. What we want people to do is keep on using our track and obviously uploading videos of their own dogs. So it's not over yet. This is just the beginning. Buddy, you know, you can get I'm, I'm looking at a band. <laughs> it's not too late. No, I'm looking at a band like Ghost. <laughs> and obviously our intention isn't, uh, you know, our intention for it was to get involved with fans and TikTok is of course not even emerging it's a ubiquitous platform now and mm-hmm. for a band we want to get on it but i just read an article uh the other day about ghost and how they have the song from 2019 that's now gone viral and it's their biggest song and it has millions of hits yeah. and it's like soccer moms and normies that are spreading the word and honestly yeah. doggy dog you know we have our core fans. We have people that actually have, have been waiting for, for this album. We know the world hasn't been waiting, and that's okay. Uh, that's not our inspiration for delivering it. But we know fans that have been waiting, and they've been waiting a long time. But what we hope to do also is connect with new fans mm-hmm. and bring people into it and see what can happen with this band. This album's given us a new lease on life. Uh, it may go for one year and that's it, or it may start a new career for us and we figure out how to be working musicians again. Mm-hmm. We don't have expectations, but we also don't have limitations put on ourselves and we never have. So just like we said in the beginning, we will take it all the way to MTV, but we'll also speak with the smallest fanzines and that's what we did when we started the band in 199 and it literally took us all the way to beavis and butthead and mtv (laughs) and all that shit so 2023 is no different we're not afraid of success but we're not that's not our main motivation we just want to connect with people amazing so come see us live join the free radicals tour stream the album and enjoy yourself that's what life's about Brilliant. Thanks, one, John. You always have, and I'm sure you always will. Thank you for coming on. It's yeah. been a joy. It has been. Stay positive, guys. Stay rocking. You, I really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, thanks uh, so and thank, thanks for making cool questions and conversations. Thank you for being on, sir. We try. We try. Make sure um, you let me know when it's out so I can share it on the socials. All right. Yeah, mate. Bye, buddy. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Bye, bye, bye. Peace.